Hi, I'm Lisa Wheel with Law and Crime. Okay, we're in the Sean Harrison case. Major developments have happened. The prosecution has rested. The defense did nothing, <laughs> called no witnesses. The defendant did not take the stand, uh, which is interesting. Some of us here at here in Law and Crime thought the defendant might take the stand. There was some talk back and forth about whether he would take the stand. That has been decided. He did not take the stand. The defense has rested. I have with me here Julie Rendleman. Julie, welcome to Law and Crime and the discussion Thank of the John, uh, Sean Harrison case. What did you think? Did you think that the defendant would take the stand? I didn't think he was going to take the stand. Okay, tell me why. Um, I, because what's he going to say? How's he going to explain away um, what transpired at the house, what the various witnesses are testifying to? I, I just don't think he had any reasonable excuse for anything that happened. And so I think that what they really were doing is relying on the lack of credibility or hoping for a lack of credibility um, in regards to the various kids that testified against him um, and holding their hat on maybe some reasonable doubt. Okay, that's it? I mean, not to be able to take the stand and say, to kind of really... But say what? You know, in a sense, like, to say to, to what? To say those kids aren't credible. Look at this. Uh, the main, the victim didn't come forward right away and 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 tell the story the first time the way it should have been should have been told. Let me sure. should have been told in other words. But yeah, um, you know he was on cross. He was back and forth a little bit. But in a sense, he really can't testify to to that. And so you know what the. Look, I mean, we always leave it, you know, leave it to the closing. For the I, I hate to, to say it, but we always, we all sit here in, in, in a sense, doing what we're not supposed to do, which is right. to say that somehow the defendant has a burden to testify. Oh, no, 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 I know. Because we exactly, feel that exactly, way. Exactly. Because we I all understand. feel right, like right. we want to hear from right. him. And, and right, and the, as a juror, right, right, you're sitting there, and even though exactly, defendant has, defendant can do exactly what happened here, right. which is nothing. Right. And they have no burden to do anything. But we all know that the jurors are kind of, well, if you're innocent, you know, why don't you take the stand? Why don't why, an innocent man would certainly want to say something, right? Right. So you know, there's that that the, the defense and the must be grappling with, but uh, but certainly you know, in cross examination, if he had taken the stand, there would have been so many questions like, really, you right? Know, huh? and, and you know, look, their perception may be that they did a good job on cross examination, and so they don't want to actually, in a sense, rock the boat. Worse, because if right. he testifies and he doesn't do well, then even if the jury didn't buy what the other people were saying, right. if they don't believe him, they're going to say, "Why don't we believe him? We don't believe him because he's guilty of something." And some of the, one of some of the last things now that the jurors are going to have to remember are the victim's testimony. Now, what do you think? Um, well, not some of the last things, but some of the things they're going to remember. What do you think about how the victim's testimony came off? I, I mean, do you think that that I, was not look? So I certainly good? think it's enough. I mean, the question you always have to ask is why enough for what the defense? Enough, the, no, I think it's enough to find him guilty okay, beyond okay. a reasonable doubt. And okay. I think the question at the end of the day is why would he being? But remember, he shot basically in the head right. um, and is permanently injured. Right. Thank God he survived. Right. And so the question really is, you know, and what you're going to ask the jury as the prosecutors, what on earth would be his motive to lie about who the person was who almost right. took his life? Right. Um, and that really, to me, is the question. And I don't think that the defense is going to have a good enough answer to get him out of this. All right. That said, then, taking that strand a little further, why... Would he go to trial over this? He being the reverend, the good reverend. Why would he go to trial over this? Why would he sit, have to sit there? I mean, why wouldn't he try to plead this out? That's a great question, and 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 I don't know that I have the answer. The the first answer might be that they didn't offer him anything that he was willing to take, and mm. the second thing may be is that the truth is is he's the reverend. And he's gotten away with this for a long time, right. and so people we look at that we see this all the time with other trials. People get a little I hate to use the word cocky, but. Mm too confident that they're going to get away with things. And so he may have thought, no one's going to believe these, these young kids, kids right. over me, um, right. and no one's going to believe I would have done this. And so sometimes that is, is the downfall for many of these uh, defendants. Well, the downfall or the, the right fall, if you will, the, the setting straight the good, fall the or good the good fall. fall. The exactly, because if, if he's exactly. guilty, then this will, this will be the right. but, but it's a very good point you make, because if these allegations are true, the good reverend has been having a completely duality of character, dual life. You know, the good reverend, and I'm putting this in, you know, obviously in, good, in quotes, 
the good reverend during the day, teaching in school, you know, fostering kids, you know, mentoring kids, I should say, um, and then, you know, running a, a sure. drug ring although on I, the side. Although I do, you know, we keep talking about him being like Jekyll and Hyde. He really was just the bad guy because all the stuff he was doing wasn't just at night behind closed doors. He was doing it at the school, at the school. you know, it, so he, making, really, he yeah. wasn't doing no, it the no, mentoring. No, he was mentoring right. kids to sell right. for him. So right. he, sell for him. Yeah. And then having starting a fight, we, one of the teachers, one of the teachers testified sure. uh, about, you know, a fight starting that the good reverend may have had cause to have started between the victim and another one of his people that you know, actually exactly. running drugs. And and the teacher going, uh, I kind of looked around and the defendant was, you know, not really doing anything. Right, exactly. Just and, watching. And you know, just kind of watching and I kind of like, hmm, this didn't look right. And she had no, that to me would seem like such good evidence for the prosecution. Why? Because this wasn't a kid who might have had motive exactly. to lie for another kid, you know, who like, get let's get back at this reverend who like we didn't like this guy, sure. we didn't like this teacher. Maybe, you know, where they were selling for him and they were trying to get back at the, at, a, at a at a dealer or something. Anything like that. This was just another teacher in the school who just happened to come across this this fight. Right. And just was like I don't think this way this guy's reacting to this fight is just bizarre. Exactly. She has absolutely no motive to at no all to lie about this all man. To lie. In fact, motive not to get involved. Why would she want to take off time for her, her schedule and, and get involved and all of that in a criminal trial like this? She wouldn't. I agree. And clearly her demeanor on the stand, at least to me, mm -hmm. was she didn't have to say it, but it was just clear just watching her. I think this guy, this Sean Harrison, this r Reverend, haha, mm -hmm. is guilty of Reverend, this. haha. Yeah, mm -hmm. Reverend, haha. Mm -hmm. And I don't like it because I'm a teacher of good standing in this school, and I don't like what he's doing to the, in the name of teachers. And that's right. just my reading sure. into it. Did you feel the same way? Yeah, I did. I mean, look, I mean, any teacher who's, you know, who, who's yeah. at the school is going to be deeply, deeply, deeply feel betrayed and offended that, that this is what was going on. I mean, I'd yeah. be angry with the school also because I, I can't believe he was there for that period right. of time and no one kind of recognized who he really was. Um, but yeah, I think that she, look, it's not, by itself it wouldn't be the strongest evidence, but when you take her, mm -hmm. what she observed coupled with what they testified to, I think it makes, kind of pushes it over the line because now you have someone completely separate exactly. who's corroborating the the kids take on what what really went down folks it's that old circumstantial evidence that we all talk about you know it's the brick on brick mortar on mortar that's how prosecutors put great pieces of you know great cases together it's not that direct evidence that smoking gun aha somebody saw the murder happen it's little pieces all together that's that's how you know, a prosecution puts their case together. So, uh, thank you, Julie. We'll, be, we'll stick right with us. We're going to be right back uh, after a short break with more on the Harrison case. And Lisa Wheel back with the Sean Harrison case. The jury uh, has gone home for the day because um, the prosecution rested. The defense has uh, called no witnesses today. Uh, fascinating case that they didn't call. Uh, defense called no witnesses. The defendant did not take the stand. So it's going to be in the jury's hands. Um, we're going to take a uh, quick report from Top Crime Story. So let's, let's listen up to that. Julie, <laughs> those top crime stories, they just uh, get your, you know, get, oh, they get me upset, but okay, anyway, those are the top crime stories of today. Um, we're following the Sean Harrison case. Again, the prosecution arrested, 
The defense put on no witnesses, so it is going to be up to the jury very soon to decide the fate of Mr. Harrison, who is charged with armed assault to murder, illegal possession of drugs, firearm, and ammunition. Of course, he's pled not guilty. Thank goodness in that case we're not talking about first-degree murder, uh, which is pretty amazing since this, uh, the victim in this case was shot execution style and lived to tell about it. So that's at least the good news uh, in the Sean Harrison case, that he was at least able able to testify as to who he said uh, uh, shot him. Um, so there's lots of important testimony to go through and analyze in this case and to come uh, as, as to go sort through it with you. Um, and I want to go primarily and firstly to Ryan Johnson, who was the police officer, who was one of the first people on the scene after the victim here was shot in the head execution style. Let's go to see what Ryan Johnson had to say. So much of this case comes down to what the victim says, saw, and will say on the stand. So let's go now to the victim uh, on the stand. What we have here is the cross-examination of the victim in the Sean Harrison case. Let's listen. Okay, we've been listening to the victim in the Reverend Sean Harrison case uh, outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And I say the Reverend Sean Harrison. He may not be a reverend for much longer if the jury comes back with a guilty verdict in this uh, in this case, uh, not a homicide case, thank goodness. Uh, tempted though, um, I have Julie Rendelman here with me. Julie, what do you think of this uh, this cross examination now of the victim? The the defense lawyer making a big point of the fact that the victim did not say anything uh, about you know going on about uh, this was uh, Reverend Harrison who did this to me. Uh, this is the man I you know pointing out right there. As he's in the hospital, this is the man, you know, pointing the fingers at the reverend at the hospital. Didn't do any of that. Sure. Uh, he thought he was going to die. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, well, look, it's funny when we talk about thought he was going to die because we right. think about that, you know, like, you know, dying declaration dying, dying where someone's going right. to be the most honest that right. they would right. be. And, and at that point, he doesn't say who the person is that shot him. Right. Um, you know, look, I think they're doing a very effective job. Um, they're doing what they should be doing, which is to create reasonable doubt for the jurors as to whether or not um, the reverend is the person that's responsible. And they're going after it, not just based on his credibility for lack of telling them, but also that he was using marijuana right. and that may have impacted his judgment. It. And quite frankly, the victim is probably giving them a bit of an attitude, which we as prosecutors, if we were the prosecutor in the case, would not oh, be happy. Or like, right. Please be res as respectful to them as you were to me. Uh, because any time you act that way, it shows a bias. However, I think the prosecution's easy response to that is when you have a guy that just shot you in the head, quite frankly, the last person you're going to, and you don't trust the police, the last mm -hmm. thing you're going to do is tell who the person is that did it because you're going to be in fear for your life and the life of your friends. And so that's going to be the kind of the excuse as to why it is he didn't come forward originally. Well, and also, I mean, Maybe you said the last thing that you're going to do. How about the last? How about what you're focused on is living versus talking about who did this to you? Well, I think that that kind of that, to me that argument hurts you because if the foot, you know, if the idea is that you think you're going to die, then the, and that's the reason for that uh, dying, for declaration. dying declaration is because you are so terrified you're going to die that you're going to be more inclined to tell the truth. So, I, in a sense, that works against the prosecution. Um, I think he didn't necessarily think he was going to die. I think that he had many things going through his head, and one thing he was going to do was to protect himself by not saying who really did it. Right. Um, and two, the concern that he didn't know where where Harrison was, like, you, you know, what he could be up to. Remember, he has a family out there right, also. He doesn't right, know right, what right. he's capable right, of. He shot right. him in the head. Now, right. what else could he do? Right. And, and if it's if it's true, remember, you know, before that, he had instigated this fight at the, at the school, he'd gotten him beat up. And so this was just, you know, just one more thing now. He'd gotten shot him in the head. Right. And like, whoa, you know, so right, exactly. things were just ratcheted up just one more level. So sure. the last thing he was going to do, and you made a very good point too, and if you don't trust the police, 
So if the police are not your friends, right. But here, let's just, Julie, take a look at this. Here's the B-roll from the actual um, incident itself, right? So you see this. Now, the jury is going to see this. Look at this. This is They are going to see this. You can't see who the person is that's doing this sh the shooting, but look at that. You actually see the time, the shooting itself, where the person st stands up. And it is really execution style. Look at that. What do you make of that? What do you think the jury's going to make of that? I mean, look, we can't see who the players are, but the right. one thing we can say is that the two individuals seem to know each other because they're yes. walking together prior to that. Yes. And I think that supports, again, corroborates his testimony that it's someone he knew and someone he had a relationship with, which supports, obviously, who it is. Right. I mean, look, some, I hate videos um, because videos can hurt as a prosecutor because the jury starts to say, is there a reasonable doubt simply because we can't see what's in the video and they forget that if you believe the witness beyond a reasonable doubt that's enough um, and so sometimes those videos as a prosecutor always made me very nervous um, because the juror starts to analyze it almost too much um, but I think at least it corroborates and supports the testimony that he knew his assailant right I mean they're walking together there and it also corroborates this idea that it really was sort of um, execution style. Exactly. That it was premeditated, that there was, you know, when you think about a, a drug sort of, a, you know, drug lord, or it's kind of, it's very small scale, but, you know, this it's not a crime of passion. Sure. It, that it is business, that, you know, you are, for whatever reason, this is a, a, a business deal, and this is what I'm going to do. You're not holding up what I've told you to do, and boom, it's execution style. And it's funny, you know, it's funny when, when, when we were talking about the idea that he's not going to say anything because he doesn't necessarily trust the police. Remember, that's why the Reverend chose them. He chose, you know, kids in his community right. that he thought he could trust that's that right. wouldn't go to the police. And so when he shoots him, he doesn't think he's going to tell who it is. He thinks he's, you know, this, there's, he has gotten silence from him and anyone else. He worked else. in a family outreach in, a, in an English high school. So he works for kids that he thinks, you know, that, that not, not that he thinks, that he knows need outreach. I mean, you this think, is, exactly. you know, this Nothing is... Nothing like taking advantage of the, of the most a vulnerable, vulnerable kids. Vulnerable I mean, that's, kids. that's what's... Oh, wow. You know, exactly. Exactly, Julie. He'd been mentoring the victims. He'd been mentoring the victim at school. Uh, all right, let's take a short break and we'll be back with more of the Sean Harrison case. Welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm Lise Wheel. We have a busy afternoon here at Law and Crime. The case, the Sean Harrison case, has uh, just wrapped up. The prosecution ended. And the defense, uh, much to some surprise around here, just a little bit of surprise, the defense did not put any um, evidence on, no witnesses, the defendant did not testify. So that Sean Harrison case, that's where that stands with the uh, jury going to be having that case any time now they'll be deliberating on that case. So that's where the Harrison case is. We're going to pick up with some more uh, analysis and uh, analysis on that very quickly. Now in Kansas, we have jury selection beginning on a very, very uh, interesting case, very fascinating case, very sad case that we're going to be following very closely here at Long Crime. Uh, the defendant here is uh, is one um, uh, Yesenia Sesmas. Um, she's an undocumented immigrant, and the police say she shot a, a mother and then disappeared with a newborn. Very sad case in Kansas. We have the uh, uh, jury selection starting today, and we actually have a news package on that that I'd like you to listen to now. What a sad case. We'll be following that case, and the jury selection, as I said, in Kansas started just today, so we should have opening statements probably starting tomorrow. You can bet Law & Crime will be on that and watch that, so we hope you'll be tuning in. Um, so now the Sean Harrison case, let me just I'll wrap you back up into that. The prosecution wrapped up on that. The defense did not call any witnesses at all, including the defendant did not take the stand. So the uh, jury is going to have that very shortly. 
Um, in the meanwhile, we want you to hear more of the victim's testimony or the cross-examination of the victim because we just got that very recently. So this is the first time really that you've been able to actually analyze that. So we want to have you hear that and we'll be back. Julie Rendleman and I will be back with that on the other side of this. So listen closely to that testimony, the cross-examination in the, the victim in the Sean Harrison case out of Boston. That's riveting testimony by the victim here in the Sean Harrison case. Uh, we're going to have more of it on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Yes. So that is just so interesting to have the cross-examination there of the uh, the victim in the Sean Harrison case, Julie Rendleman. Um, what do you think, uh, Julie, that when you have the victim on the stand, if you're the defense attorney and you've got a victim who has survived an, an attack like that, now you as the defense attorney, you think that you know your, your client is not the person who did it, but you still have a victim. Mm -hmm. You still have a person who's been shot in the head and we've seen the footage there. That is, that, there's no denying that he's been shot in the head. Um, how hard do you go on him and not, you know, you don't want to, you know, have the jurors hate you. Right? It's a great question and I don't know that there's an easy answer. I think the first thing I would say is I think you need to prepare them in, um, whether it be in your opening statement or during jury selection, that um, they cannot take offense to you defending your client. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to make sure they're on board to expect potentially an aggressive cross-examination. Second, I think you have to decide um, how aggressive your cross-examination is going to be based on who the person is that's in front of you. And I say that because if you have an individual that is calmly speaking to you and is not sarcastic, is not obnoxious to you, then you attacking them is not necessarily going to behoove you in front of the jury. I mean, look, we could be, you know, if you have a 90-year-old woman and you're going after her oh and screaming at her, you, you have no perspective as a, right. as a defense attorney. Right. Um, That's and so put you, put you exactly. on the other side. Right? And so the jury not, probably right. won't listen to you anymore except they just won't like you. Um, right. And I think we're all, as being on both sides, I've been guilty of both. I think sometimes you really have to think out what your cross-examination should be and the tone you need to take throughout each witness to kind of gauge um, whether the jury is going to be listening to be, be mad at you or be more inclined to listen to whether they don't believe who you're cross-examining. Right, right, okay. Yeah, because it's really, it, it's as I'm listening to the testimony, I'm thinking of how that's going to play with the jury as they're sitting there because folks, as, as you're watching and you're watching all these trials, you know, we can't show you, um, nor should we be able to, the jurors. I mean, they're sort of the silent partners there, but they're, they're like we are watching all of this. And, you know, when they go into the jury deliberation room, we can be deliberating, as Julie and I are talking about sure. and analyzing, you know, every step of the way. But they're the ones that they're watching all of this, you know, every little last thing and every step of it. You know, they can't go out and, and for any part of it and take a break or get a sandwich or do anything like that. They're watching it and their verdict is, you know, the actual verdict. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this kind of thing where the defense, you know, exactly what they do and how hard they push on somebody um, like a victim, because whatever you think about whether or not Sean Harrison actually is, is the, you know, the defendant here actually is guilty, we have a real, true victim. Sure. So, speaking of, let's go back and hear more of that cross-examination. And now, now that we, Julie and I have had that discussion, think about if you were the defense attorney in this case, how would you handle that? Let's go back. Interesting hearing him on the stand and hearing him out, you know, selling marijuana or not selling marijuana. I mean, I'm just listening to him, I'm taking notes, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about how that testimony of what he's saying relates to uh, what what he says later, um, and about the the ins you know the 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 facts that there that came out in, in the course of the whole prosecution, Julie Rundleman. Um, and 
y you know, the in the cross, there's so much focus on, you know, the Reverend was accusing you of stealing from him, right? So is that a motive for him potentially for lying, all right? Accusing from stealing. Uh, then he said, well, you really weren't talking about much about selling. So was he, is he, was he lying about that? So then there's a question of, are, is he a liar, you know? But all of this, of course, I'm thinking is, is in the context of, he's been shot in the head. Right. It you also know, it also presupposes that the reverend is a drug dealer. So it which does, is, it does which, indeed, which okay. in and of it itself is indeed. not a good look for the jury who's deciding whether or not on top of him being a drug dealer is going to shoot the guy he's not happy with. Correct. Um, there is one thing I do think that the defense has going for them, and I, you know, it is I don't know that being short on 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 sales is is a good motive for very good for, point. for shooting very good point really yeah. is that enough i don't know yeah but i understood the innocent i can't believe i'm going to say this i understood if you're a drug dealer and the guy's not doing what you need him to do that you have the yeah the, the kids guy got beat him up kick right. him or pu punch right. him or beat him up I get, him I get that to show him who's bought but the the aspect of shooting him in the head seems to be a not little uh, much over the top right. and so that motive may if i was the defense like, be, really? Uh, Would that, you right. know, for a reverend? Oh, by the way, my understanding, and, and that we don't know this 100% because he didn't take the stand, so there wasn't an ability for that cross-examination of, uh, of him on the stand to, for this to come right. out. Um, but my understanding is he does not have a criminal history, this None. reverend. Right. 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 So... I mean, he seemed to have some connections to some gang activity. I think he bragged right. about it and had some pictures in his, uh, in his home. But no, but no actual criminal history. But no history. actual criminal history. So you're right. So you add that in, um, you would think then, you know, really to go from sure. zero, from the zippity zoo to, you know, zippity doo to that, you know, well, it's execution funny. style. And then you start to wonder, should the defense have said, you know what, he was a drug dealer. We accept that the reverend is not a, not a know, great not, reverend. But he's not the shooter. Like, you know, right. and, and kind of had said, you know, like, but he was, but maybe, but that's a good way to set him up because everybody knew that he was a drug dealer, low level drug right. dealer. Except that the person who's saying that he's the shooter is the actual victim, you know? And so right. that's the problem that they go back to, which is why is the victim lying about who the shooter is? I mean, he could be protecting his friends. I mean, I right. guess that's possible. I, I, by the way, it, 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 it's plausible, except, except that we have shown corroboration for everything else he said. Right, right. Fascinating. Okay, uh, let us go to a quick break here, and then we'll come back with some more analysis and some more trial testimony from the Sean Harrison case in uh, the Boston, Massachusetts. <music> We are back with the Sean Harrison case. This is a case tried in Boston, Massachusetts. We had just finished today with the prosecution side. The defense did not put any evidence on. They did not put the reverend uh, on, the, on the stand. The reverend does not testify. Now, this is a case involving a uh, the Ron, uh, Sean Harrison, uh, a reverend, is accused of living kind of a double life. Uh, both as a teacher mentoring at-risk kids at this high school where he was accused of also running anti, uh, running a, uh, a low-level uh, uh, drug ring. He's facing charges of intent to murder um, in, this, uh, in the South Boston community. Um, and uh, he allegedly shot his victim in the back of the head but the kids survived, and we've been listening to testimony from the victim earlier today. He was shot, uh, the victim was shot execution style. Um, very, very sad case, um, but at least we have this victim who was able to testify, and we've been listening to the victim's testimony earlier in this, uh, in this broadcast. We're going to go now to uh, not the victim, but another friend of the victim, also who is supposedly, allegedly, in this low-level drug ring, who's going to testify about his doings both in the drug ring and his doings with this Reverend Sean Harrison, who is again on trial for not murder, but um, assault and guns and ammunition, 
all of those, but not murder, all one level below murder. Let's hear. All right, Julie Rendleman, if this, if this witness is telling the truth, then he's talking about a fight that is now going to be been set up by Sean Harrison uh, to with, with, between this guy, this victim here. This I actually I am a witness, but I actually do think he's a victim of another sort. But between this witness and the victim in the case, what do you think so far? So I mean, obviously he, you know, this is I think direct, and so direct. he's he's admitting, even though he's being led in some way. Right, he's <laughs> that's what, that's where the confusion right, was. Right. Um, the direct seems to indicate that he it's get, it's coming out that he had lied to the principal or whoever had asked as to why he got in the fight. I think initially right. he says, right. I, I I went after him because he he was talking about my family or my mother, and so I was lying. Why was he lying? He was lying to protect Harrison um, because in fact it was Harrison that put him up to it. I think a juror can understand why he would lie. Right. Um, it goes it's back the, to what we're talking. It's, right. it's the person that put him up to it. Right. So um, that's these are authoritarian authority figures. So all right. So now let's look at this. Is a little bit of video here um, that we see. I think, in fact, it was actually another teacher that actually introduced this video. Okay, here you see it. The fight um, between the, per the person that was just on the stand and the victim in this case. Okay, so you see the the fight that actually, if you're if you're hearing this rather than listening to it, you could you, what you were, what you would hear, what you saw, was the victim that was just the person that was just on the stand getting into a fight with the victim, the person that was actually shot in this case, uh, being pushed into uh, what's actually another room where <laughs> we'll see Sean Harrison come and not actually do anything in a few minutes here, um, just sort of mill around and not do well, there, yeah, just not do. A hill of beans, right. which is what another teacher will testify. Well, right. she won't say not do a hill of beans, but that's pretty, that's my test. And remember, we know exactly, and we know that Harrison has a relationship with these young men. So if anyone's going to react, right. he is because good gonna, point. These are the ones he's mentoring oh to say, like, you know, this Come is on, the last. I'm mentoring you. Stop exactly. it. This is, this is like this is exactly. not what you do. This is like I've taught you not to do this. I've mentored you. I've, right. This is what I've taught you not to do. Exactly I think they've the made opposite. a clear case that he's a drug dealer. I think the issue becomes whether or not he's the shooter. You know, and I think that maybe the defense can separate the two. Who knows? Okay, but <laughs> you're, th you're yeah. thinking about it. Let me, let yeah, me see how you're like going to come back to me. It's like, okay, if they give up the fact that he's a drug dealer, then that makes it a very interesting, small little swirling place there, then in this town. Because if he is now the drug dealer of this little group of, of guys, then who else well, could it be? You're because right. now you're, that you've really narrowed, you've, lived, you've narrowed it down. Yeah, you've really narrowed that world because um, then you get into motive and opportunity and and motive and motive and motive. Because if you give up that he is the drug dealer, mm -hmm. who sure, else mean, is there? Right, really? but and just but, randomly somebody's going to come an execution style. But I don't know how you? they get around him being involved in uh, drugs or being a drug dealer based on the uh, the extrinsic evidence we have, extrinsic evidence we have, right. including what was recovered in the house and whatnot. So I think that's the problem for them is they you know they have an uphill battle when it comes to him being the drug dealer. You know the qu the, the real question at, at the end of the day is did they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he shot this kid in the head and so that really the only witness to that specific event is the, the victim, victim. Yeah. And so it's whether the jury buys that what the victim is saying not really what anyone else is saying but what the, the victim is saying although obviously the testimony of the witnesses to say that the uh, reverend was unhappy and wanted them to to give him a beat down kind of leads into the motive so we you know that kind of moves the ball. Right, the right, right, right. In so many cases, as you said, you know, so many cases you don't have that direct evidence of the of you know somebody who actually saw the person shoot another person and say, you know, I I was there and I saw it. Here you have the actual right victim who was shot execution style. Say, I was there. I survived this. 
And that's the guy. It's funny because even, God forbid, he hadn't survived. I believe that they still would have, they would have put him on trial, even without a witness. And, I, you know, because I believe you still had circumstantially a case against him to prove based on the motive and based on everything that had happened before that he was the individual that would want him dead. Um, so if that says anything, then the fact that the witness is alive and able to identify the person who did it makes it all the long, all okay. more strong. Okay. Well, I, it's fascinating to me. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and at the other side of the break, I want to. We're going to have more uh, testimony from this uh, one of the. Uh, again, I call him a victim in all this because he's. But another one of the students uh, who was engaged in a fight with the actual victim in this case. So stay tuned. We'll be right here on the other side of the break. Welcome back to Law and Crime in the Sean Harrison case. Fascinating case where the prosecution has just rested. Now, remember, this is the case out of Boston. The Reverend Sean Harrison has been charged uh, not with murder, but assault with a weapon, ammunition charges. He's the one who's sort of, we've been calling sort of Jekyll and Hyde, where he was in the daytime. Well, I don't know if it's daytime or nighttime, but the daytime, well, certainly daytime, he's been working as a, uh, a minister and a teacher at the local high school and then running allegedly a drug ring with these local boys and uh, allegedly shooting one of them execution style. He's the victim survived and has actually testified. We've, li we've listened to that testimony earlier today and we just listened to the testimony of one of the young men who was engaged in an altercation with the victim set up allegedly by this Sean Harrison, sort of all in this plot. Um, and we're going to now go to the cross-examination of this young gentleman. Let's hear what he has to say under cross-examination. Um. Hello, you're listening to a victim or a witness in the Sean Harrison case. He is the pastor out of Boston who has been accused of shooting a boy that he actually mentored, shooting that boy in the back of the head. Um, he is accused of being a gang, uh, uh, running a uh, 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 actually drug deal, uh, of dealing a ring, uh, drug dealing ring, uh, when he was actually supposed to be mentoring these young boys. He's accused of assault with a deadly weapon, intent to murder. Um, and all sorts, all sorts of uh, lesser charges, intent to murder, um, and, and, and gun charges as well. Um, he's, he lives in a uh, South Boston community. Uh, previously, he'd, been, uh, pu he'd publicly complained about lack of religion in public schools in this Boston area. He's been uh, charged with this. The prosecution rested today. The defense put on no witnesses, did not put the pastor on, as many of us thought he, they might put him on. The jury has gone home for the day. We expect that they will deliberate after closing arguments tomorrow. Let's go back and hear more of the testimony today from one of the boys who testified in the trial in the prosecution's case in chief. And Hi, I'm Lee Sweel with Long Crime. You've been listening to, the, to a def, uh, witness in the Sean Harrison case out of Boston. You remember, this is this Boston pastor accused of shooting a boy he mentored there in a high school. Uh, in a high school, he's a teacher accused of shooting a student execution style. Uh, Sean Harrison, also a preacher, he befriended at-risk students. The surviving victim in this case said he started selling drugs for Sean Harrison. Harrison is a facing is facing assault case uh, assault uh, 
charges, armed assault with intent to murder. Uh, very fascinating case. The prosecution rested. Uh, defense did not call any witnesses. We were thinking here at Long Crime that he might testify, Sean Harrison might testify. He did not testify. That case then will have closing arguments tomorrow and will go to the jury most likely tomorrow. And you'll have that here on Long Crime. Also on Long Crime, we will go to Kansas where they, uh, tomorrow, where they've been picking a jury in the case, fascinating case, a uh, very sad case involving yes, Yesenia Sesmus uh, is the defendant there. She is a woman who's going on trial for murder uh, in Kansas of a Kansas mom, abduction of little baby Sophia. Um, very sad case, but we're going to be hearing that. Again, they're picking a jury there in the case. Imagine picking a jury in that case of uh, picking uh, just, I don't know how you do that, but we'll find out tomorrow when we go to Boston for closing arguments in that case, that Sean Harrison case that we've been following now for quite some time, and Kansas for the beginning of a brand new murder trial, law and crime. Follow us tomorrow. We'll see you. Take care.